Cool. Kia ora koutou. Nau mai haere mai. Uh, ko Lorna Dugan aho He kai mahi e te moana. So, good evening everyone. I'm Lorna Dugan from Experiencing Marine Reserves. Welcome to, it might be our second uh, biodiversity um, webinar. And I'd like to also introduce Sophie. Um, I'll pass you on to Sophie now. Kia ora koutou. Um, my name's Sophie. I'm also an Auckland coordinator for EMR. And just here to help uh, Lorna deliver our biodiversity and conservation webinar. Excellent. I'm excited to dress in your jammies. Cool. Awesome. Um, no worries. Uh, what we'll just make sure is that uh, if you've jumped in, uh, that we will just make sure you're muted. Um, I should be able to mute everyone. Perfect. So. What we're going to be touching on today is uh, a bit about um, the Hodeki Gulf on the conservation side of things. And then we've, we've, what we decided to do was more of a, a freestyle. We've got a bunch of images uh, a, with uh, animals that we find within the Hodeki Gulf and northern New Zealand. And we're going to talk about them. We thought we'd, we'd keep it pretty casual today. And if you guys have got questions or if you've got specific topics that you'd like Sophie and I to cover, Chuck them in the chat and we should be able to answer them at the end of each um, little, at the end of each slide. Perfect. So, Hauraki Gulf, Tikapa Moana. So the Hauraki Gulf spread uh, is from Tiarai, uh, just north, as uh, just, yeah, just south of Mangafai, out towards the Mok Mokahino Islands, around Aotea, down past the Mercury Islands, and then I think it's about Tairua, is where the, the um, Hauraki Gulf Marine Park covers. So it's a huge area um, and it's got some pretty amazing spots within it. However, we do have some issues within the Hauraki Gulf and probably the main issues would be overfishing, pollution, habitat loss, and we've also got climate change coming in there. So there are some things with the Hauraki Gulf that need a bit more, Araha need a bit more love. So a bit more about the overfishing side of things. We've got both recreational and commercial fishing, which is impacting the Hauraki Gulf. Um, and it's creating a, a, a really definite um, shift in the ecology and it, a lot of you guys probably know a lot more about the, the, the relationship between kinna and snapper and uh, coda and crayfish and how that trophic cascade works. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about that soon. Um, we've also got pollution. So not only do we have, you know, plastic pollution, we've got a huge issue in the Hauraki Gulf about sedimentation so every time you have a um every time that you have a um sorry i'm just admitting people as i'm talking which possibly wasn't the best thing to be doing <laughs> um i'm uh so you've got every time it rains especially if, if you've driven around uh -huh. auckland any time recently oh, apologies if you've driven around Auckland um, any time recently, you've seen the huge amount of housing developments that are happening. Every time that you break the earth um, and it rains, that sediment runs off down our gutters into our into the Hauraki Gulf, into our estuaries and out, um, which causes huge issues both um, both for um, our you know our filter feeders because it clogs up their gills uh, but it also um, impacts um, the, the clarity throughout the whole Hauraki Gulf so after that torrential rain we had the other day I'm sure you could have seen in an aerial photograph or if you've been lucky enough to go up in a, um, in a plane you would have seen these huge sediment plumes out would you like to add anything to there Sophie? Um, yeah no uh, yeah and um, obviously in terms of uh, sediment pollution as well um, on on seaweed as well. Uh, we're noticing more and more buildup of sediment on seaweed that will obviously impair photosynthesis, and seaweed will um, look quite a, a lot more degraded in areas with heavy heavy sediment versus um, uh, more clearer waters as well. So it's not just the filter feeders, but also the 
the uh, primary producers, those seaweeds that are affected as well. One of the uh, other interesting points, and I think I talk about climate change in a little bit, but um, is spots where you've got more acid, you know, with that ocean acidification, the tests or the um, the outside of our kinna or any of our shellfish becomes brittle, especially in the juvenile stages. So you can really impact many things throughout the ecosystem through a few changes on land. Um, we've got a huge amount of habitat loss. We were talking before about that trophic cascade. Um, I, I, you, I'll have you know that every Eclonia forest, so every seaweed forest has a small man in it in New Zealand. No, um, <laughs> this is Alan. Um, and I took this photo just to showcase the biodiversity beneath the kelp forest. And um, if you've ever been lucky enough to be able to dive into uh, an Eclonia forest underneath these, so these up and down things are called the stipes. And if you're able to go down and under there, it's like a dark twilight world and it is absolutely amazing. And it's very interesting to see what grows in that zone. But if you have out of control kind of populations, you, you lose that whole understory. It would be like the biodiversity that would happen in a, um, you know, in a paddock versus, you know, a Cody forest. Uh, a, would be a nice comparison um, and we also have um, we also have got the effects of climate change and you've got the ocean acidification side of things affecting our um, echinoderms so our our um, sea stars our kinna uh, affecting uh, their growth and reproduction we're also getting a whole bunch of species within New Zealand which were previously considered vagrant or um, rare visitors from the tropics but as our water gets warmer and warmer we are getting more and more visitors that stay and then they're able to reproduce so this I can't remember the name of the nudibranch right now um, but we found this up in um, gosh which harbour was it at? Uh, it was just north of Maitai Bay, yeah. Maitai Bay the peninsula. yeah so this was up in um, the far north and this species that had only been seen once in New Zealand before, and it's a tropical species. So we are starting to see more of these. We're finding, you know, um, black spotted goat fish um, just recently, uh, just seabirds alone. I think over the last weekend with um, Cyclone Dovey, um, I saw an amazing account of all these uh, frigate birds and terns um, that aren't found in New Zealand that have blown their way down here. And it's the same for our tropical species. A lot of our trop tropical visitors, like the Lord Howe coral fish, which we find up at the Poor Nights, they can find their way down here. They can survive as adults, but they can't reproduce. So um, we haven't been able to establish populations here, which is in some way quite good because you don't know what niche that they're going to push out one of our uh, local species on. Um, but as that water gets warmer and warmer, we are going to be able to have um, these species survive and we don't quite know what impact that will have. Um, one other thing to mention about kelp and climate change is kelp is a temperate species. So it likes that sub, you know, subtropical, you know, it likes a little bit of warm water sometimes, but when, when the water temperature gets really high, seaweed doesn't do very well at all um, and it can't cope. So I, I was lucky enough to go up to the Kermadex back in 2018 and that's halfway between here and Tonga. And there's no, there's some encrusting sort of algae, but there's no seaweed up there because the water's too warm. And considering when I was there, the water temperature was 20, I think it was 25 degrees. The water temperature right now in the Hodaki Gulf is 23. So each summer the Hodaki Gulf was getting warmer and warmer. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens on that front. So how to fix the Hidaki Gulf? And this is from the news, uh, NZGO article um, that was written by Sean Lee, who is an amazing supporter for experiencing marine reserves. Um, first thing would be to stop the destructive fishing meth methods it, to protect the marine environment, to decrease the catch. Oh, it's meant to say reseed, um, shellfish beds and riparian plant. So I'll talk about each of these now. Um, 
in the Hauraki Gulf, we have quite a few destructive fishing methods that are not only commercial, but recreational. These are some of the commercial ones. We've got long lining, which as far as as far as uh, commercial fishing go, it's probably one of the better ones, apart from seabird capture, um, a bycatch. Uh, bottom trawling, if you've ever watched a video of this, it's pretty, um, it's pretty horrific. They tow, uh, tow this net behind boats. They've got t uh, two trap doors and a big heavy roll bar. And it goes through and it completely wipes out e everything in its path. And it's really interesting when you look at areas that have been trawled and it completely removes all that bent thick, so bottom, all of that bottom habitat just starts to disappear. And um, some of those corals, especially if you're doing mid, uh, like deep water trawling, like for orange roughy or some some of areas like that, you know, the um, the soft corals and corals down there in the dark, they grow so slowly, like 500 years would be not that old for some of these corals. So if you do go through and you've completely wiped out everything, it takes a very long time for that habitat to restore. Also in the case of orange raffi, some of those fish, you know, they live to 140 years old, they start reproducing when they are 40. 40 years old is when they start having babies. And most of the time when you see them in the shops, they are smaller than they would be before they've had babies. So you're removing a huge part of the population. Uh, and then uh, you've got Danish seining and you've also got purse seining. So purse seining is better in some ways because it doesn't have that destructive um, aspect to the sea floor, but purse seining quite often has a high bycatch of seals and dolphins and other big pelagic species that um, end up being caught by accident. In terms of recreational um, destructive methods, one of probably the most destructive would be uh, trawling or dr dredging for scallops. Um, most of the Hauraki Gulf now with the, the new uh, rahu from Nasu Manahiri, um, uh, most of northern Hauraki Gulf is now closed for scallop fishery all around um, Waiheke from Natipawa is closed for the scallop fishery. Nati Hay down in the Coromandel has closed theirs. So there's only very few places in the Hauraki Gulf now that you can collect scallops. And there's partially, I th think a huge amount to blame would be that destructive dredging has completely um, removed a lot of the source populations that were reseeding those beds. Um, another destructive one for recreational fishing would be any sort of set net. And because with set nets, they are not uh, non, um, not, you can't choose what you're catching when you put out a set net. You, you put it in for its soak time and then you take it out. So I've seen people um, down at our family place at Opito Bay and Coromando, I've seen people bring their set nets out and they're eagle rays, there's sharks, there's, a, you know, marble fish, which is a horrific, you can't, can't eat marble fish. Like, you, you try and feed it to the cat and the cat turns its nose up at it kind of deal. Um, uh, so you, you can't select what you're catching. So if you are going to recreationally fish, which, you know, I think everyone should be able to go and catch fish, um, rod, at least rod and spearfishing, you can be a lot more selective on what fish you do catch. So Something else we can do in the Hauraki Gulf and all of New Zealand is protecting the marine environment. Now, whether this be a rahui, a marine reserve, the new high protection areas that are proposed within the Hauraki Gulf, pretty much we don't care what it's called as long as it's long-term and no-take. And those long-term no-take areas allow us to be able to have pockets that can reseed the remaining. What they found in studies uh, on the Great Barrier Reef is that if you protect 30% of an area, which are uh, representative of 30% in patches, your fishery, your commercial fishery, will catch exactly the same amount of fish as they were before. So if we were able to pr protect 30% of the Hauraki Gulf, the fishing would stay exactly the same we'd still catch exactly the same number of fish. So, and then it would have the pop, the opportunity as those populations became really 
um, high to be able to start reseeding the rest of the Gulf. When they looked at, um, they did genetic studies on crayfish as they settled down onto reefs. So crayfish spend 18 months um, as larvae hanging around in the water column after uh, they hatch. So they go through all these larval molts and they're cruising around and they, they travel a really long distance. And then they listen out for the sound of a healthy reef and they'll go, oh, that sounds like a nice healthy reef. I've got some friends there, I'll, I'll settle down there. What's happening is those little poor crayfish, they can't, they're listening out for the sounds of these healthy reefs and, and the, reefs, the reefs are quiet. They can't hear anything to be able to go, oh, okay, maybe I will settle here. When they do go out and do the crayfish surveys and they find crayfish and they genetically test them, pretty much all of them have come from stock inside the marine reserves because there aren't big breeding individuals outside of those reserves left. So I'd hate to think what state the Hauraki Gulf would be in without the marine reserves we do have. So we've got um, in the north, we have um, uh, Motuhaure or Go Island, we've got Tafaranui. For a bit further, further south, we've got Okura Marine Reserve, we have Motu Manawa um, near Point Chev, and then out on Waiheke, we have Tematuku, and then in Coromandel, we have Te Whanganui Ahe. So we've got six within the Hodeki Gulf Marine Park, and they cover, what is it, it's less than 1% of our area of the Hodeki Gulf. So what we've, we've, we've got some, we've got some framework, but it's not big enough, and with the Rahui, we have they're fantastic, um, but a lot of them are only for uh, a couple of species and the other species are starting to get really hammered. So I really think it's time for us to sort of take back ownership of the Hiraki Gulf and, uh, you know, create a sort of future for our children, because otherwise there's not going to be anything left if we keep um, doing what we're doing. Um, one other big thing that we need to do is decrease the catch. So we need to reduce limits for recreational fishermen and for commercial. So it's not just one or the other. We need to drop it all back um, down in, we we're talking about the scallops before, down in um, Golden Bay, down on top of the South Island, their scallop fishery collapsed about four or five years ago, no, more than that, close to 10 years ago, their scallop fishery collapsed and they called a morat uh, moratorium, a complete closure. And then they've been monitoring it since to see if it comes back and it, it hasn't. So some places we, sh we might be able to, if we, if we close things now, it, we, we may be able to bring back some of that biodiversity, but quite a few of them, once it's gone, it might be gone forever. So we've just got to enjoy what we've got. Some really cool projects that are happening. So Ngāti Whatua o Orake is doing a really cool project within Okahu Bay. Um, they are reseeding the mussel beds uh, alongside Revive Our Gulf. And in the Hauraki Gulf, you know, Firth of Thames area, um, that whole Firth was carpeted with green lip mussels. And they created a, um, a biogenic reef, so a, a reef that's alive down on the sea floor. And when Captain Cook came down, he described the Firth of Thames as being the most crystal clear water he'd ever seen. Now, if anyone's been down there recently or gone to Thames Town and looked in the Waiho River, you'd be lucky if you could see your hand. Um, so there's a huge amount of sedimentation in there. Originally, when those mussels carpeted the, um, the Firth of Thames, originally they could have filtered the entire firth in a day and a half i think it would take over a year or two years and to be able to do that now with the remaining population and that's including the mussel farms so we've lost a huge amount of um, biomass from that area but what um, Ngāti Whātua Ōrake is doing is they're reseeding mussels within their bay to help try and have a biological control to be able to sop up some of that um some of the um sedimentation so when it's a little bit um there's a little bit of sediment the mussels suck it in they eat all the yummy bits and then they create what's called pseudo feces so they poop out these they're, they're like fake poos and they poop them out and these little pellets sink down to the bottom and it's like a little flocculating agent so it means it attracts the sediment and be able to put 
take that out of the water column. So you end up with better water clarity when you've got mussels uh, or any filter feeder, which is very exciting. The other thing that we can do, and all of us can help with this, is riparian planting. So we were talking before about the effects of sedimentation. If you are able to plant up the sides of um, all of a catchment, so where the water comes down and heads out to the sea, um, you are able to create these buffer zones. And um, what's the magic number, Sophie? Is it seven metres either side seven of creeks? Metres, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you're able to plant up all the creeks, um, a really cool success story would be down in Raglan, uh, where uh, Fred Litchwark, um, he created um, community nurseries within... Um, uh, actually, it was like prison, I think it was in prisons. He created nurseries and he got people to be able to go out and plant up the entire catchment. They went from having no cockles, no pippies, because the sediment, you know, you'd walk out and you'd be thigh deep in the, that's fine, awful, stinky mud. With it, after planting up the entire catchment, they know that the cockles came back. They were, the fishing improved, the white bait started running again. You know, it's amazing what you can do just from changing what's going into the system from the land. Um, I just realized we have some stuff in the chat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we have, uh, a, we have a little <laughs> question about um, referring to the mussels and what seeding means. Oh, yes. Yeah. So reseeding is just putting them, putting uh, commercial mussels, so the ones um, from SPAT, that have been grown on in the farms is they're, they're taking those mussels and they're dropping them onto uh, the, the bottom uh, of Okahu Bay. Um, and so mussels are very interesting because, um, you know, when you if, you, if everyone's eaten one and then they've got like the little hairy bits at the bottom, those are called bissel threads and th they can attach onto anything and they can attach onto each other or a uh, substrate as well. So like rocks they'll attach onto, but they'll also attach onto each other. So you can drop them all down to the bottom. Um, so that's what seeding is in this case. Um, We're also finding with the, the reseeding the mussel beds as well, it's creating a whole new habitat to attract in other species as well. So you're not only are you getting that filter feeding aspect, but you're also bringing back more of the biodiversity in the bay as well, because there are places for fish to feed in and hide in. And it's basically like a, a magnet for um, species to be drawn back into an area. So uh, yeah, it has multiple benefits for the bay. Definitely. Um, and sorry, Chris, I also missed your um, comment about rotating marine reserves and have like a five to 10 year no take. So what we found down in um, where at the, the Astrolab Reef, where the arena hit back in, gosh, was it 2011 that it hit? I can't even quite remember. Few, quite a few years ago, um, they closed Astrolab Reef for three years uh, just as a shipping hazard. Um, I've a lot of our friends did uh, the surveys on the site down there and the biodiversity just after three years of it being closed was absolutely amazing. Um, they tried to get a rahui put on it for at least two years so that they could protect it further. It didn't go through. It opened up. And within two weeks, everything was gone. So, yeah, it, it can be quite difficult. And that's what they found in Kaikoura with the closure because of the earthquakes. They brought back all this biodiversity from not being able to collect power. And then within one season of it being open, they're all gone. So... Unfortunately, with the population we've got, it makes it a really difficult thing to be able to open up areas again. So that's why our protected areas need to be long term, unfortunately, because with the population we have, it's the tragedy of the commons. Um, you know, if if your neighbour might get it, you rush off and grab it off them. Um, but I, there's a better way to extra, describe the tragedy of the commons, but I can't quite remember off the top of my head the best way to describe it. But keep asking your questions and, and um, asking about to topics in that chat. Okay. Um, opportunities for riparian plant planting. 
So uh, our, we've got a sister organization, which is Whitebait Connection, and they do some riparian planting. Uh, and we'll make sure we share with you guys this winter uh, what opportunities are coming up to volunteer for both organizations. So we'll make sure we share that with you guys too. Okay, so let's crack into biodiversity of the Gulf. So this is the fun bit. The, that bit was kind of like the slightly depressing part about the Gulf, but it's good to know what we can do and what the tangible things are that we can um, we can move forward and create, you know, a really uh, positive space within the Gulf. And I think that's something that experiencing marine reserves does really well. We don't just experience marine reserves. We take people into all parts of the Hauraki Gulf, both protected and unprotected, and people are able to see what the inner Gulf habitats look like, as well as the outer Gulf, you know, pristine sort of habitats like, you know, Mokohino Islands and Goat Island and some of our offshore spots. So I just thought we'd crack straight into something that you're probably never going to see while you are, um, are being a snorkel guide for EMR. Yeah, <laughs> while you are volunteering, we probably won't see one of these. Um, above my friend's head here is a bronze whaler. When I took this photograph, I didn't know that there was a shark there. <laughs> um, we hadn't seen it yet. This is the first time we saw it. Now the shark swam so close over our heads that I could have tickled its tummy, uh, which was pretty exciting. And it hung out with us for the whole day and it was very cool. Uh, highly recommend if you get a chance to swim with one safely. Um, I've thrown things in in a bit of a haphazard order, and I figured that I'd just talk about some of this, uh, some of the things here. So this is one of our black urchins, and as you can see, when you shine a torch on them, they're actually this beautiful purple colour. Our urchins and starfish and sea, uh, sea uh, not sea slugs, our sea cucumbers are all related. And um, so they're part of our echinoderms. They've got really interesting um, biology is they don't have like a vascular system like us. They don't have bones and blood and muscles. They've got what's called a stone canal system. And so up the top, You've probably seen it most often on a starfish. They've got one bit that looks slightly different on the top of the starfish, and that's called the madreporite. And what they do through the madreporite is they suck in the water, and then they use that water like hydraulics, like a digger, to be able to move their either spines or their, um, you know, their feeding arms or their tube feet, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, I absolutely love them, and I had a point, yeah, Liam said this is a kinna, yep, and this one is from, it's only in northern New Zealand, and it is spreading more and more throughout, um, like 10, 15 years ago, um, I had uh, maybe see, I'd see them occasionally in northern New Zealand, and now I see them regularly, and I see them quite far into the Coromandel as well, so this is another example of species that are spreading as um, they arrive in New Zealand. Ha! Huh, only Bermuda and New Zealand have all kinds of echinoderms. I like that. I like that. Fun facts from the fun facts from our crew. Um, what else have we got? So I realized that after I put this photo, because I was like, oh, this photo is very pretty. And then I was like, wait, there's a person. No, the seal's here. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are seals in this image. Um, our Kekanor, our fur seal. Uh, is a pretty awesome um, critter in New Zealand and especially in northern New Zealand um, because all the they got hit real hard from uh, commercial sealing and before that um, pretty much they were very tasty and people ate them and then used them for their fur so a lot of our populations in northern New Zealand um, were completely wiped out but yet in the last 10 to 15 years the population of fur seals has exploded now that we have protections for them um quite often pretty much in winter in the Hauraki Gulf I'd be lucky if I could go out and not see one um I've seen them at Tiri Tiri Matangi I've seen um them all around the um Whangarei coast all around the Coromandel coast um and all around the Hauraki Gulf. Actually, I, I saw one just at Rangitoto one time. So, ooh, they love huia. 
Um, so yeah, and they hang out out west as well. So keep an eye out for Kekanal uh, or our fur seals. Um, bear in mind that if you do see them on land, please stay 20 metres away because imagine a very large angry dog and that's pretty much what you've got with a seal. Um, they are actually the only mammal in New Zealand that can carry TB, fun fact. Uh, or So don't get bitten by one. No, 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 not TB. Uh, uh, rabies is the only um, new, uh, only New Zealand mammal that carries rabies. So don't definitely don't get bitten by one. Oh, oh, fun! Another fun fact: uh, the old sealers, when they were, you know, going and clubbing seals, they'd have to be watch out that they didn't get bitten because they got a thing called seal finger, and pretty much their finger would rot off. So um, fun fact: so don't go clubbing seals and don't get bitten by one. Yep. Is that right. fun, Lorna? Is that fun? <laughs> <laughs> Fun um, I'll also add as well. <laughs> I'll also add as well um, for if you do um, encounter a sea fur seals or kikanor, especially juveniles, and they look like they're in distress or anything like that, um, make sure you call it into dock. Um, don't approach or interact with them, but definitely call it in because often uh, at a particular time of year you do get some. Uh, juveniles that get a bit lost <laughs> and get a bit trapped uh, inland because um, uh, they've got a bit disorientated. So um, yeah, the, there's a um, dock hotline that you can call just to um, so they can go check it out and make sure that that juvenile returns safely to the sea. Another fun fact, uh, down in the um, Papakura Macca's drive through a seal did go through the drive through So you do find them in strange spots because they quite often will swim up creeks and end up in random paddocks. The other fun fact, uh, uh, Olivia popping up had just reminded me of this, um, is the other seal that we see in the Hauraki Gulf and we are saying to see lots more of is our leopard seal. And our resident leopard seal um, hanging out at West Haven is Orpha uh, and uh, she she is a three meter uh, leopard seal and that's definitely a seal you would want to stay at least 20 meters away for, especially with her um, delight in popping uh, inflatable tenders and um, yeah, ru ru rubber boats are her kryptonite. Wait, no, kryptonite, the opposite of kryptonite. Yeah. Um, oh, catnip. <laughs> catnip. Yeah. Catnip. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I just had a question from CJ saying using the term sea star instead of starfish in Oz. To be honest, I think it's just a pedantic, um, you know, they are sea stars. And then within sea stars, we've got like um, brittle stars and we've got a whole bunch of different cushion stars. And But it's, as a common name, when we're not getting into the nitty gritty of, um, when we're not getting into the nitty gritty of, you know, scientific names, I'm sure star nobody is going to begrudge you calling it a starfish. Go go hard on starfishing. So our manawa, our mangroves. We absolutely love mangroves uh, for EMR and this, some of our sites with mangroves make the most exciting places to explore. Um, ooh, uh, I just saw that uh, Olivia said as well that it's for 0800 leopard instead of 0800 doc hot for if you spot uh, a leopard seal. And so that's uh, leopardseals.org, is it? I can't quite remember. Oh, I've gone backwards. Um, <laughs> oh, I've gone backwards again. Obviously, I'm very good at running a, a webinar. I just, I just have everyone know. Um, <laughs> all right, so job. move back onto mangroves. Santa mangroves are a really exciting place within the Hauraki Gulf. Now, mangroves are not frost tolerant. So that is why we don't find them in the South Island. And we don't find them historically. The, the furthest um, you'd find them on the West Coast was about Kafia. And then the furthest on the East Coast was Tauranga. Of course, what is happening? Our winters are getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So our mangroves are able to survive and colonize areas that they previously weren't in. So it's not that they're out to get everyone to take away your pretty sandy beach. They're just making the most of sheltered estuarine habitats. And now that they're able to survive. Now in the lower limit, so somewhere like Tauranga, you only find mangroves at about a meter high up in um if you go further north so somewhere uh like you know up in the far north 
the mangroves can be four or five meters tall, these beautiful trees. And as you go up into the um, up into the upper reaches of estuaries, it's like going into a jungle. So for our Te Matuku paddle, we we go through this winding stream through the mangroves and you can see all the um, the, the birds in there. And quite often if you're somewhere like the Whangateo, which has beautiful clarity, or if you're up in north in the Matapoti estuary, is very cool as well for this. You paddle board through, it's crystal clear. You can see through, you can see the pororo, you can see the mullet. It's very, very awesome. Um, right now in this shot where you can look underneath the water, you see those little sticky uppy bits? Those are called the pneumatophores and those are the breathing roots uh, for mangroves. Oh, some messages. Do, do, do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, our um, mangroves, we've got one species that's endemic to New Zealand. And then um, in, yeah, in the tropics, we've got uh, lots of different species. And the way our mangroves work is slightly different to the way that it works up in the, the tropics. But what they've found is that spots that are starting to infill, so our, our harbours are naturally infilling. So it's a process. Um, in New Zealand, we have a lot of highly erodible soil. So every time it rains, that does naturally go into our harbours. And over in like a geological time frame, our harbours will all infill. And then the next time we have a big ocean level rise, it will flood valleys and we'll create, start that process again. So it is a natural process, but of course we are speeding it up somewhat by having large areas of urbanization, agriculture, and then, you know, things like um, forestry as well. So this uh, shot is, is, I think she was from Westlake Girls, this girl, um, but um, Snorkeling in mangroves is absolutely amazing. If you get a chance to do it, uh, the Whangateo estuary is absolutely fab. Uh, we've got the dates uh, at the end of uh, this presentation. And if you haven't registered as a volunteer already, um, we'll make sure we uh, share it with everyone that's registered. Uh, okay. My aspect ratio has gone slightly skewer, so my pigfish looks extra fat. Um, so the one um, in the, the bright, colorful one is a pigfish. If you go up and to this area here, it is a there is a male Sandangas ras out in the open water behind it. There's a female Sandangas ras ras up here on the left. There's a scorpion fish down in the middle. There's some kinna. There's a hiwi hiwi in the background. There's a blue mau mau there, and in the bottom right hand corner. There is a teeny weeny little blue eyed triple fin. And that's just a couple of the things that we've that are in the shot. So this is in the Mokohino Islands. And it's amazing to see when that you have some reduced fishing pressure, how amazing the ecosystems can be. Yes, the scorpion fish is very cool. Um, they're one of our what I call them poisonous, venomous. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've got they've got spines on their back and um, I wouldn't I would highly recommend not touch them they're a cousin to the stonefish these guys aren't going to kill you but it's very uncomfortable so just make sure especially when you're at the poor nights or the mokahinos or one of those offshore islands make sure that if you're kind of like a bit close to the rocks that you're really keeping an eye out uh, that you don't sit on one so sandangas rasses this one is a beautiful boy um i'm just i feel like i've talked too much so i'm gonna let sophie talk about sandangas rasses because i know she loves them <laughs> um kia ora guys um yeah so um this image was taken again at the mokinos um and you'll notice that um these guys are pretty curious they get right up close and personal and um a couple of cool features of sandagas ras is that they are what we call sexually dimorphic so males and females look different to one another so this one here in the image is a male so we can see the striped patterning with the yellow flash of color. Um, and then the females are usually just more of a tanny pink color all over. Um, and uh, yeah, that sexual dimorphism is um, not as common in most fish species, but there's um, also our spotty or pakirikiri that also have that difference between male and females uh, in the size and uh, shape of their spot as well. 
And uh, these guys um, are, um, yeah, they're, they're herbivores. They like to munch on the algae and the kelp and the seaweed. Um, yeah, they're pretty cool. Pretty cool guys. Awesome. From the one that bit my finger that one time, I think they might be omnivorous. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, they, they, they do branch out a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do eat some um, little crustaceans and bits and pieces, but they're not they're not going out to generally take a chunk out of you. That that one did, but I was probably asking for it. Now, um, <laughs> and the cool thing about Sandanga's wrasses, as Sophie said, is that they're um, sequential hermaphrodites, so start female, turn to males. But the male has got a group of females, like a little harem, and he does not want his females turning into males. So what does he do? He puts them on a diet. He's like, hey, Matt, no, lady, no, don't eat that. Don't eat that. So he stops them from eating so that they don't get too big. But if someone comes through and oh, eats that big male, next biggest female, she's going to be like, oh, yeah, it's my time to eat some food. And then she will turn into a male and repeat the process with the other lovely ladies, which I think is just fantastic. Uh, we've got some kōhero here. Um, now, a lot uh, of the time when you go out in the Hiraki Gulf, you'll see um, school, schooling fish in the inner Gulf. The most likely one you're going to see is um, a yellow-eyed mullet. When you get a bit further out, you're likely to see kōhero, and then you'll see kahawai coming in and feeding on them, and then you'll see kingfish coming in. Now, the really big, in like Trevally as well, the really big bait balls we used to see in the Hodaki Gulf. So it used to be that you'd sit on the lee coast and look out towards Hotaru, Little Barrier, and you'd be able to see huge workups moving across the Gulf. And these huge workups, they'd sustain our, our dolphin species, they'd sustain our brooders, whales, and this huge seabird um, population as well. So unfortunately, a lot of the bait fish are now being, you know, that that per se, uh, they're being taken and you know removed from the ecosystem so that these bait balls just have ceased to exist so birds are having to fly further to be able to feed their chicks you know dolphins have started to you know move out out into the right into the middle of the Hodaki Gulf to try and get some peace and quiet and feed. I was out there uh, on Hawaii, the University of Auckland's boat, um, just having a little ride along, and they were going and um, looking at common dolphin pods and looking at uh, relationships between um, I think relationship between gannets and common dolphins. But what they were find like you know, as we found the school, you'd look over and there'd be four, five, six boats zooming straight towards these schools as well. And bear in mind, we were in the, like, it was off peak time. It wasn't mm. middle of summer and we, we were on a weekday. Imagine what it's like in the weekends with people zooming to these uh, big workups. Oh, Olivia has shared a fantastic fact with us. No, it's not fantastic. It's depressing. But um, Brooders whale diets have shifted to now be 60% plankton based, moving away from fish based, which they would have been originally. So what is there is changing and adapting, but hopefully we're able to continue, the, you know, the species in the, in the Hodaki Gulf are going to be able to keep up with the rate of change. Ooh, selectively seek out selps. I like that bit of uh, alliteration there, uh, Olivia. Um, and I'll talk about selps soon so that you know what selps are. Uh, lion's mane jelly. Um, we've got lots of species of jelly around New Zealand. We've got our moon jellyfish, um, are the ones with the four little like squares on top. Um, we've also got our immortal jellies, our Turritopsis rubra, um, which are pretty fantastic. Um, what else have we got jellyfish wise? We've got our not they're not true jellyfish, but siphonophores. We've got our Portuguese man of war and by the wind sailors. Um, we've got a few interesting jellies around New Zealand. We also have selps, and these these guys are more closely related to us than jellyfish. Huh. Well, no, maybe not quite more closely, but um, in their larval stages, they have got um, a notochord, so they are urochordate, so they're almost at the state of being a vertebrate, which is something with a backbone. 
Um, they're just like one tiny bit off. Uh, and these guys are either colonial or um, some are free swimming uh, and they are filter feeders. So they're sucking in, they're part of, part of our um, plankton and they're sucking in delicious smaller plankton and processing it. So you'll end up with, uh, so if you ever go to the beach and go, it feels like there's fish eggs in the water or something, you know, those little jelly strands. So those are selps. They don't sting. Uh, though sometimes when you've got big mats of uh, salps, you can quite often have jellyfish in with them. So bear that in mind because you can qu quite often get stung by jellies at the same time. Um, they're very cool. I like salps. Also, when they uh, live um, communally as well, they share roles between them. So they'll kind of specialize in a particular part in the chain. So that's kind of a true communal uh, organism, which is quite uh, rare in the animal kingdom is quite cool. Awesome. I took this photo just uh, the other weekend out at Ofanake Bay and I've just realized, I can't remember the name of this little guy. Little guy. So if, do you remember what the name of that tiny little um, uh, white bit is called? Do you remember the name of that limpet? Okay. No, no, this is a snakeskin <laughs> chitin, obviously. When it comes to naming things in New Zealand, they're not very original. It looks like snakeskin. They called it a snakeskin chitin. The difference between chitins and limpets is chitins have got those um, plates and limpets are one whole piece. These guys are really awesome. So they zoom around on the rocks. When I say zoom, zoom is very relative here. Uh, they zoom or along the rocks um, and they have got a radula on the bottom so a raspy tongue which has iron tips on it so they rasp their tongue onto um, the rocks and they scrape off the algae and eat it. In this photo as well it's quite uh, there's a couple of interesting things here so the pink on here is coralline algae or coralline yeah so it's coralline um, so it's the one sort of coral we have in New Zealand and quite often you'll find um, if you look at stuff closely most stuff will have a little pink covering on it which is fantastic and then you see below here we've got uh, some barnacles and barnacles are a type of crustacean and they're initially in their larval stages they are free swimming so they swim along and then they spot a place that's called a settle and then they go and they super glue their head to the rock and then when you see barnacles feeding, it's actually their feet. They open up those two plates like this, and then they stick their feet out and they use their feet to be able to catch um, yummy things in the water column. Oh, near. <laughs> um, kinna, we were talking about kinna before. This is the very hungry kinna. Um, would, uh, when I mentioned before about things looking pink, especially if you go down underneath the seaweed with a torch, a lot of the rocks will be covered in that uh, coralline um, turf. Now, kinna, um, unfortunately, do a lot of eating of seaweed. And um, this one here, I can't remember the name of the seaweed unless you remember off the top of your head, Soph. My seaweed ID is subpar. But we've got a sister program called Love Rimu Rimu, which is seaweed. And if you want to learn more about seaweed itself highly recommend um, checking out their website and we'll share that with everyone afterwards as well um, I've already covered about the stone canal system oh cool thing about kinna is that um, their mouth parts it's called an Aristotle's lantern and they have five teeth that grow continuously that self sharpen on each other and quite often they're a very noisy bunch when you dive down you can hear that <laughs> I don't know if I'd have made a very good kind of noise then, but I gave it a crack. Um, that clicky pop noise. Oh, yeah, that's probably more like it. That popping noise. Uh, a lot of the time will be either kinna or our big eyes, a type of fish. They make a really click, a clicky poppy noise to communicate as well. So when you have your head underwater, it is not quiet. If it's quiet, there's something seriously wrong. The reef is a noisy, noisy place. Tamure, or our snapper. Oh, a question from Stephen. Do all kinna, do, do kinna eat all species of seaweed? Now, as a fun fact for us as well, all species of seaweed in New Zealand are edible to humans even. Um, they Some of them vary on palatability, uh, but um, 
I'm sure some types of kina are more delicious, um, but you know, oh, seaweed, in this yeah. photo here, oh, sorry, <laughs> can, yeah, seaweed, <laughs> not kina. Um, the photo that we've got here with the snapper, you see this like coralline turf here, there's this little tufty stuff. They can eat that too, but it's a lot harder than for them to eat and they would prefer to eat stuff like a clonia, like, no, yeah, I've got pictures, oh, here food. we go, a clonia. Um, so this is a clonia. Um, when you have a look down uh, at the one on the right hand side, it's got its blade up the top and then it's got its stipe down the bottom and then the bit that attaches to the um, substrate or the, the bottom is called the hold fast. So of course what can happen uh, within the hold fast is if a kinna comes along and obviously kinna can't swim so they come along and they get to this seaweed and then they go hop nom 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 they bite the stipe and then it, once the stipe disappears the whole the, the the seaweed falls off completely so it grows from oh remind me where does seaweed grow from sophie is it from down the base or is it from the top i think it's from the top i can't quite remember I will need to research seaweed more and report back to the glass. Um, I will admit that I am not a seaweed expert. Um, speaking of kelp fish, or its Maori name is Hiwi Hiwi, I will let Sophie talk about Hiwi Hiwi because she is the Hiwi Hiwi whisperer. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I don't have much to say, but <laughs> um, yeah, so Hiwi Hiwi, this uh, cute little guy was uh, snapped at Go Island, their super comet Go Island. And I included them in the presentation just because as a volunteer, this is a fish that you might see. And often people mistake them for marble fish because they have similar patterning, but marble fish are generally uh, a bit larger in size. Um, here, here we're a bit smaller and um, yeah, they're just really cool fish. And obviously they are really good at camouflage. So um, they are one fish that relies on the kelp and seaweed to um, evade pred uh, predation. So again, a type of reef fish that would be heavily impacted by things like kinnabarans or the reduction of uh, seaweed cover um, as they would uh, become very uh, vulnerable to predators. Still on the theme of fish that would be very sad without kelp mm -hmm. would be our crested weed fish. And I'll let Sophie chat about this one as well. Yeah, so this was um, quite a... Cool. So this photo was taken by Crispin Middleton, and um, he uh, he has an organization called Seacology, and along with his partner, um, Irene, uh, they do a bunch of awesome research um, and advocacy work around New Zealand, but also, I think, in uh, some Pacific Islands as well. Um, and they recently teamed up with some other EMR friends um, to do a little short doc short doco or short documentary about the plight of the crested weed fish um, so as you can see they are super super well adapted to live in and amongst our um, kelp forests our seaweed forests um, so this one uh, is blending into its um, kind of more orangey seaweed uh, surrounding but they can uh, be multiple different patternings depending on the seaweed that they're trying to uh, camouflage into and um, they're pretty small fish, so really hard to spot. So um, in the documentary, they kind of, um, you know, uh, it was a bit of a process to, to um, getting to spot a crested weed fish. But again, another species that is incredibly vulnerable to um, the loss of our uh, kelp forests, our seaweed forests through the process of kinnabarans. Um, so we're seeing less and less sightings of crested weed fish um, but if you do ever see one on the reef, definitely do sight it down on iNaturalist. If you're lucky enough to have a camera on you, take a little snap if you can. Um, upload it to iNaturalist because that really helps us to track and it'll help Irene and Crispin track their populations um, and kind of uh, see how their populations are potentially declining or increasing or shifting around um, the North Island. So, yeah, they're really, really cute fish. And if you've got any younger kids uh, that are looking for fun activities, we also created a cute little activity sheet based around the documentary. So we'll share the documentary 
um, when we do a bit of a follow-up with a bunch of other links, I'm sure we'll send through. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, there's a little activity sheet that goes with that, um, that uh, kids can learn a little bit more about this um, cute little weed fish. Awesome. Thank you, Sophie. Um, something else we do see in the Hauraki Gulf is we do see turtles, believe it or not. Um, this one, this photo in particular was taken in the poor nights, but I have seen, um, I have seen a green turtle, um, down in, uh, Coromandel, which is part of the Hauraki Gulf Marine Park, middle of winter. I had a green turtle swim by me and I was just stopped and went, what? And at that point, I didn't realize that we had them in New Zealand. It was originally thought that they were a vagrant, um, so that they arrive from the tropics. They couldn't really survive here and they would go home. They don't breed here because it's too cold, but we do have a pretty solid population. Uh, if you do find one on the beach, make sure you call Doc Hot immediately. Huh. It was a meter turtle near the Harbour Bridge. Yeah, not surprised. They wash up in the Hodeki Gulf all the time. So if you do find one on the beach, they don't haul out in New Zealand unless they are very, very sick. So make sure you call Doc Hot. They will call uh, probably Kelly Talton's and Auckland Zoo. They'll go to the zoo first. They'll get um, checked over by the vet team. And if they're in a place where they can get uh, looked at, um, uh, rehabilitated, they'll go off to Kelly Talton's. And then Kelly Talton's looks after them until they're ready to go and sets them free in New Zealand, which is some pretty cool work by Kelly Talton's. Oh, this is not a green sea turtle. I have not uh, updated uh, this <laughs> caption. <laughs> um, this is an uh, eagle ray. Difference between eagle ray and stingray is this eagle rays have got pointy wings, flap like a bird. Stingrays, round wings, magic carpet. Now, with our uh, rays we have in New Zealand, uh, the cover image for this is a short-tailed ray. Um, but we also have got a long-tailed ray, which has got slightly pointier wings and a slightly pointier nose and a longer tail. Um, And so those are the three main species we have in New Zealand. We also have some skates and we have electric rays called torpedoes, um, which are pretty rare, but um, one of my friends actually managed to get a photo of one, which is pretty cool. Don't want to touch it. Um, The way we tell the difference uh, between boy and girl elasmobranch, so our sharks and rays, is that we look for claspers. And so the claspers are underneath the tail. So we can look at this individual and we can see, does anyone want to comment whether it's a boy or a girl in the chat? So you can get in there quickest. Boy, girl, boy, girl, it's a girl. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. Olivia. So you, you can't yeah. see those claspers underneath the tail. Now on some of, um, <laughs> for that shark, um, in that initial photo, that um, that bronze whaler, we were really unsure whether it was a boy or a girl because that gentleman, he was a boy, but he had very, very little claspers. They were only, you know, they were very, very small and we weren't sure if it was a boy or a girl. But um, when they're younger, it can be hard to tell. We've got some things in the Hodaki Gulf that aren't meant to be here. So we've got a Mediterranean fan worm in the Hodaki Gulf. Pretty much anywhere where there are boats, there are, oh yeah, (laughs) I love this chat. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's not the size that matters, yeah. Um, For Mediterranean fan worm, uh, you, uh, anywhere, you you put me off, you put me off, uh, (laughs) off here. Yes, Liam, fan worms are pests. They are invasive. They're not meant to be here. They've arrived from bilge water from big ships, uh, ballast water, um, or they've arrived with uh, things on the base of um, boats. So there are some of the other ones that we are looking out for. The Asian paddle crab, you find them at Takapuna. They're the ones that bite your toes if you're swimming at Takapuna. Um, and there's some tunicates as well, some sea squirts that are invasive. There's lots of seaweeds. We've got undaria, which is wakaame, uh, which is what you eat when you eat no- uh, no- noddy, the seaweed, um, Japanese seaweed. We've got lots of that around the Hodaki Gulf. Unfortunately, yeah, anywhere where boats moor or berth, we do end up with pests. Now, fan worm, maybe about 10 years ago, they were trying to control the spread within the Hodaki Gulf. Unfortunately, that ship has sailed, ironically. Uh, now, and 
and there's no really controlling it. If you do see it outside of Auckland, outside of Whangarei Harbour, do make sure that you report it um, to Northland Regional Council because um, there are spots in Northland which it hasn't spread to yet. Now, if you were to go down there and think, oh, I'll, I'll remove some of this Mediterranean fanworm, if you go down and pull one of those out, if you leave even one segment of the worm, they will regrow. Also, if you go and pull them out, they start broadcast spawning. So they start spewing out um, sperm and eggs. Uh, so by removing them, you quite often make the problem worse. So don't try and take them out. Um, this is just, this is a shot actually at Okahu Bay Wharf, uh, the, the, the floating pontoons. I think I fell in. I think I, one would hope I got in on purpose, but I possibly fell in. Um, and uh, pretty much all the pontoons are completely covered in the Mediterranean fan I mean, You can just see in this one area how high that density is. And the main reason that we worry about them in New Zealand is that in the in the Mediterranean where they're from, they are quite solitary. They um, have got like natural predators here. Not much actually likes eating them, and they can create really dense mats. And the the papery sort of parchment tube attracts that fine sediment. So usually spots that have the high sediment. Okay, a uh, uh, question from Paul, uh, Paulette about the Mediterranean fanworm. Um, there's, it's known to be in the Whangarei Harbour, and there's a few, I think it's definitely in the Tutukaka Harbour, uh, and I need to, I'll, I'll make sure I share um, where MPI is actually looking for now. I'm not sure exactly where in Northland. It changes year, year by year as it sort of spreads out. I know it's definitely up in Hohoro as well. We've also got some lovely bottlenose dolphins within the Hodeki Gulf. Um, there's within sort of the larger Hodeki Gulf area, there's about 200 odd uh, uh, bottlenose dolphins. Um, they, oh. but he couldn't do it. oh, hi, Chris. I'm just going to mute you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> And um, our bottlenose dolphins are pretty cool. Uh, they're up to about four meters. Um, Goat Island, this was shot at Goat Island in very, very bad visibility. And I had about eight or nine dolphins just swimming out of the murk at me. And, you know, that cacophony of the echolocation, the clicks and whistles. Oh, I just, I love dolphins, but um, they are very big in the water. So they're four, about four meters. Um, our um See you later, Lena. Um, our dolphins. Something you'll definitely see is our pirori. And our pirori um, hang out in all of our inner golf habitat. Quite often they can be in really big schools. This photo was taken by Sophie out at the Noisies. Um, quite often you'll be out and you'll have a large school of pirori come down. They all descend onto a little patch of algae. You, go, nom, 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 nom. you can hear them eating and um, They've got quite a big beak, which is cool. We talked a bit more about um, we talked a bit, bit about mussels earlier, so I won't touch on them. But especially out at Otata um, and other spots around the Hidaki Gulf, you know, there would have been mussels on every single rock in the intertidal and subtidal, and on that benthic, on that bottom habitat. There's only a few left around the Hodeki Gulf, few spots, and people are pretty um, specific now about not taking them. Now, the rahui around um, Waiheke, it does include kutai, the mussels as well. Oh, I'm very jealous, uh, Marcel, you, that the school, your school group got to have uh, dolphins up at Goat Island. One of, not my school group, but Samara's school group got to have a pod of orca come through their group up at um, Goat Island. And so they had, you know, the the bull orca with a two metre fin swim right through their snorkel group. And the poor shore person was peep, 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 peep on their whistle. Emergency, emergency. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. They were very stressed out. <laughs> um and the other thing, especially in um, like our Tor Bay site and our Takapuna sites, our sort of like inner golf, nudies, nudies all the way. If, if you haven't seen the short little um, 
doco that got done about Nerdy Bronx uh, that I did uh, with uh, RE News. We'll make sure we share that with you guys too, and then you can have the full fun facts about nudies. Um, but these are lemon nudies, uh, and they're both lemon nudies, and they can come in a, a bunch of different colors. We find nudies, you will find these nudie eggs, and they lay beautiful spirals of these eggs um, and they take turns so quite often you'll find spirals near each other so they are nudie brunks are sequential hermaphrodites and they will go and they will take turns one will lay the spiral of eggs and then one will go around and fertilize those eggs and then they'll swap and then they'll each have a go which is very cool um, it does look like a flower leaf it's very cool um, uh, Evan has a question, is the black coloured muscles different to the green lips? Yes, they are. We've got a black muscle and the black muscle in New Zealand only gets to about maybe this big. Our green lip muscles, I've seen ones that were over a foot long. Like they, they get absolutely huge, uh, which is very cool. I'll pass you on to Sophie. Cool. So last couple of slides to um, finish up before we again um, open up to any more questions that you might have. So coming up really soon, we have Sea Week. So if you're not familiar, NZAE um, does a Sea Week every year, um, usually around March. So this year it's from the 5th of March to the 13th of March, I'm pretty sure. And during that time last year, we did our first ever fish of the year kind of like bird of the year but I want to say better <laughs> um basically we, we were like okay our fish kind of need a little bit more love there's um usually a lot of tension put on our land animals um and our ocean animals um get a bit forgotten so um we decided to start fish of the year to highlight different fish that are found around New Zealand get people excited about learning more about uh, what's found um, native in our waters and vote for their own fish and kind of campaign for their particular fish of the year. Um, so last year the winner was Eagle Ray or Fidepo um, and uh, we're going to be doing it again this year. So uh, again during Sea Week and um, yeah we really encourage you guys to um, get on board and share fish of the year with your friends, get as many people voting as possible um, voting will open on the 5th of March at the beginning of Sea Week and will close on the 31st of March. And uh, there might be some cool prizes as a few incentives to get voting. So, yeah, uh, we'll make sure we share that when it goes live. But, um, yeah, we'd really like you guys to help us spread the word. It would be awesome. And to wrap up as well, we've got lots of volunteering opportunities. Obviously, summer is super hectic for us. We've had a couple of um, quiet weekends over some uh, public holidays and cyclones <laughs> that have disrupted some plans. <laughs> but every season there's always um, there's always something that um, gets thrown as a curveball. So um, we've kind of shifted to some dates around, but um, we've got a volunteer specific event coming up um, that's focused around um, free diving training. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna put my volume down so that pinging doesn't happen um and yeah so that'll be i think all the free diving spots have been taken already i think lorna is yeah there? so the in water free diving part has been taken but um we still have plenty of theory spots left and if you're a new volunteer or just want to cover some snorkel like advanced snorkeling skills and so duck diving and equalization techniques and that side of things we're happy to I think we've got a maybe four or five spots left on that one. So if you want yeah. to sign up yeah. to the free diving theory bit and then come into the pool and hang out with us uh, with the EMR side of things, we're all going to be together. But um, yeah, the free diving, it just won't be. Doesn't have, yeah. Cool. cool. Um, then our next um, proper full snorkel day is at Takapuna on the 26th of Feb. So we're still looking for volunteers. There's still plenty of volunteer spots open. Um, we usually communicate most of our um, registration links for events through MailChimp. So you can sign up to that on our website. Um, you can also register to our database as well if you haven't done that already. And we also post a bunch of our registration links on the Facebook um, volunteer group. 
So um, I recommend signing up to all those different things. So you might make sure you don't miss out on any communications. Um, but I'll reshare the links for that because we still definitely need plenty of help for our Takapuna snorkel day. And it's really cool. Um, really excited to show off the nudibranchs that we saw when we were filming with Ari. So it's a really cool site, very accessible, which is why we do it there so that um, families don't have to travel, you know, an hour, hour and a half to get up to Gull Island. They can still snorkel with their families um, in a more accessible uh, location. Then speaking of Gull Island, during Sea Week, um, we're going to be running our Gull Island Day, back to back with our Whangateo Snorkel Day. So Whangateo is that beautiful harbour um, estuary with the mangrove shots that Lorna showed off earlier. So we're going to do a weekend event and there'll be an opportunity to stay overnight at the holiday park at Whangateo. Um, so you can make a week of, weekend of it. Um, so registrations for Go Island are open. I haven't shared the link yet, but I'll do that in the next couple of days. And I'll be getting uh, Whangateo live in the next couple of days as well. Generally, once you've registered for an event, uh, in the week leading up to that event, myself or whoever's leading the event will email you with more details. If there's like overnight aspects, we'll um, give you more details on that. So that's generally how we stagger our communications. Um, then we've got a kayak paddle day in Papakura uh, in Monaco on the 19th of March. I'm hoping I got that date right. <laughs> and I'll be getting that uh, live next week. So we generally usually have about six spots on our kayak days. Um, so yeah, and they, they're good fun and they're a pretty chill volunteer day um, as basically you're just kind of extra bodies on kayaks, um, helping out a little bit to sit up and pack down. Basically you just get to have a fun kayak around, which is always good um, and get to listen and learn about the Monaco. Uh, we also, during Sea Week, have the Mangari Kayak Day. It's not on this list because it's currently full. <laughs> All the volunteer spots are full. But Sustainable Coastlines is running a cleanup on the same day uh, in conjunction with our Kayak Day. So I'll share that link with you guys because if you still want to participate in that event and um, volunteer for the cleanup, there's still tons of space available for that as well. And it's going to be a really fun day. And there's a chance that people might not turn up their kayak spot so if that's the case, we might be able to sneak you in on a kayak as well for that day. Um, we then have our Shakespeare Snorkel Day on the 27th of March. Um, so that was the one that got shifted, unfortunately, because the park double booked us. Very sad. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's been shifted to later in uh, the month. And again, there's still plenty of spaces left on that snorkel day. So I will share that link with you guys soon. And then lastly, our last two snorkel days that we'll be running uh, at near the end of the season uh, are on islands. So they're on Rotorua Island and Motutapu Island. And they're going to be back to back as well, just because <laughs> that was the only weekend that Fuller's had available, unfortunately. Um, but it's a really fun day. Um, they're pest-free islands, so it's actually really interesting on land as well as in the water. Motutapu in particular um, we snorkel at Administration Bay, and that has been set up as a voluntary no-take. So there's actually a decent amount of um, snapper that come and interact, um, and it's a really, really special spot. And then Rotorua, also really cool restoration project going on with the Rotorua Trust. Um, they've been doing a ton of work on the island, restoring the habitat, um, reintroducing species. Um, and so, yeah, it's a really fun day as well. So um, these are just some of the things on the horizon. Um, and also, alongside all of our events, um, we also do school delivery. So during the week, if you ever have a spare day or you work weekend days, so you've got weekdays free, feel free to email me and I'll send you through our school delivery um, calendar. Um, so you can pick and choose which days you might want to help out on. It really, really helps us. A lot of our schools struggle with parent helpers that are willing to get in the water or have the skills or confidence to get in the water. And we usually have a pretty strict ratio. You can see some of them snort clean there in the water. So that's our adult helpers and our students snort clean in the water. So we have a, quite a strict ratio and it really helps us when we get some volunteers helping out as well on those days. And the schools really, really appreciate it. 
It's a fun day. It's usually at Goat Island, so you're guaranteed a good time with these guys hanging out. Um, so yeah, definitely email me if you're interested in that. Um, sorry, that was a lot of information at one time. <laughs> how, how many words can we put on one slide? Um, no, um, thank you so much, Sophie. And it's something to add as well. I don't, lots of workplaces allow, um, lots of workplaces uh, allow you to do a voluntary day paid or one or two days. Like I know that Kelly Talton's does, Auckland Zoo does, a lot of workplaces do. So check out what your workplace has, because you might be able to come out for a day with us and get paid by your work to go snorkel. Um, we also do um, casual programs. So if your workplace wants to come out snorkeling with us, um, we can organize um, not this season because we're absolutely slammed, but uh, next season we can totally take do Christmas parties and bits and pieces as well and do private snorkels as, uh, as well. Um, uh, the one thing that we didn't pop on there is if anyone needs to refresh their first aid course, we are running one. I think there's currently a six spots left on it. Um, and for vol EMR volunteers, it usually is about uh, $220 odd dollars. It's $190 um, and that's the unit standard as well. Um, and that's on Sunday the 27th and we'll make sure that's shared with you guys as well. So Stephen just asked, what ages do you do schools? Eldest two are now at Long Bay College. Um, Walkworth Primary, we work with their year ones and twos. Um, I think the year twos go to Goat Island, don't they? Or the year ones go to Goat Island? Yeah, so Snell, Snell, yeah, Snell's Beach is our youngest ever with year twos. Walkworth, it's year threes. But yeah, year twos above, essentially. Yeah. Um, we're, we're pretty flexible. <laughs> You'd be surprised indeed. at who we can get in the water. <laughs> and on snorkel days, um, the lower, lower limit is four and up. I used to like say four to 104. We had someone in their 90s come snorkeling with us and his wetsuit, he'd obviously got out of his garage and he, as he walked, the moths flew off his wetsuit and the dust billowed behind him. It was, it was great, actually. He absolutely loved his snorkel. Um, I'll open up to everyone now. If you want to ask any questions, now's the time. Otherwise, uh, and we'll, Sophie and I will stick around for a little bit if anyone wants to have a yarn to us. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for... Um, joining us this evening and um, asking questions and being engaged and apologies it was a bit maybe a bit harder in the beginning I'm not that good at webinars but I'm getting better so um, it was yeah lovely to have everyone today so thank you so much for being uh, part of our webinar I'll stop recording now if I can figure out now how do I stop no. I'll, um, I'll also mention as well, if you know a school that's interested as well, um, this term one and term two are full, but um, moving into term three and four, um, we can take casual bookings, or if the school wants to try and apply for um, a funded program as well, we can look at um, any like local board funding or specific funding for that school. So yeah, feel free to spread it around.